Great. You're special, man. I mean, you were going to hook me up, so I, I got to do that. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and start now. I'm uh, Kevin Finisterre. I work for Department 13. Uh, the first thing I like to say when I do a talk is that my commentary is not necessarily affiliated with the companies that I work for, um, does not necessarily represent their views or positions or that of anybody that we work with. Having said that, I do work on the Department 13 Mesmer Counter UAS team. And Mesmer is a platform that gives you situational awareness over drones in a particular geographic area and gives you some options to uh, mitigate them. Hi, my name is John Hunter. Mike! All right. There we go. Now this thing's going to twist on me. See what y'all made me do? Hello. All right. Yeah, right? Is this like right in my face too? <laughs> That's better. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> All right, so that, that was the dry run. We're going to try again here. All right, so I'm Kevin Finisterre. I work for Department 13. Uh, I like to tell everybody that my commentary is not necessarily affiliated with the company that I work for, our clients, or uh, anybody that they're affiliated with. Um, having said that, I do work on the Department 13 uh, Mesmer Counter Drone platform. Uh, Mesmer is a platform to allow you to get situational awareness of drones over a particular geographic area and give you some options for mitigating them. This is our standard marketing. Uh, you can listen to our CEO discuss the background of the platform in your own time. I'm not going to sit here and feed that video to you. Um, people always ask me why our company is named Department 13. And there is actually some background story there. Uh, one of the founders of the company uh, back in the Cold War used to work on a sensitive project. And as some of those projects did, uh, there was some obfuscation with regards to where the funding would come from. And an easy way to do that would be to uh, set up fictitious names like Typing Pool 12 or Paint Shop 22. Uh, Department 13 was one of those names that our founder carried on to the company. I work on the Department 13 Red Team. Uh, I get a chance to work with a lot of uh, really talented individuals. We were recently featured on National Geographic Breakthrough. Uh, there was an episode on counter drone technology and we were able to uh, demonstrate some of our uh, platform. Uh, there's a video uh, of us dumping a DJI Phantom in the dirt. Uh, if you sit and watch through this, um, it, was, it was an interesting event to go to. Um, the people that I work with are uh, involved in a number of projects that are uh, tied into the security community. We've got folks involved with Killer Bee, uh, Kismet, Aircrack, and a number of other things. And ultimately what this allows us to do is uh, have access to a lot of magic uh, that allows our platform to, to mitigate drones, basically. Uh, we also have a blue team. Uh, so it's not just folks that are responsible for mitigating drones. We actually do have a software platform. Uh, we've got folks that are responsible for our releases and actually keeping the product uh, together. Uh, the Mesmer platform itself uh, can be operated in a standalone fashion, uh, or it can be run alongside other platforms. When we deliver the platform standalone, it comes in a Pelican case, and uh, it, it's, in essence, a software-defined radio uh, with some GNU radio software. And we've got a lot of special sauce built in for mitigations for specific drones, basically. Uh, we have a standard product uh, maturity timeline, just like any other uh, company would have. Uh, we're currently... Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. You're so wrong, man. This, this is warm. So we are currently in our uh, version 1.5 uh, part of our timeline. Uh, Chug. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 my God. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Oh, 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 Yes. Well done. 
So in our uh, 1.5 product offering, we're adding some telemetry frequencies to the product, in particular 433 and 915. So we basically, the main point is we're trying to evolve the product and add more features and retain stability. Now, apart from my involvement in Department 13, I'm heavily involved in the DJI jailbreaking scene. I've uh, basically helped create uh, you know, community of individuals that's centered around targeting this particular project. Um, I serve as, as glue for our community, basically. I'm a master cat wrangler, if you will. Um, so we, we've been lucky enough to have some folks uh, involved with Retro ROMs, uh, which is a, a website that was uh, involved in archiving video game ROMs. And they got involved in our project, and they've basically been the, the front page for where we share our information. Uh, so if you go to look for more information on us, you can go look at that, that retro ROM site. Um, I'm one of the original gangsters, uh, as, as the core of our team calls ourselves. Uh, Freak Van Tienen was another gentleman that, that started things with me and, and we call him Super Freak, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> kind of, kind of hard not to pass that one up. So how did this all start? Um, I had started looking into DJI uh, vulnerabilities back in November of last year, and I ran across a gentleman named POV uh, who was sharing information on RC groups. And basically, he had sh shared that he had rooted DJI's Mavic and uh, showed that it runs Android KitKat. Um, so while discussing this, he basically dropped the file system onto the internet, and that started a lot of people looking into these vulnerabilities. Uh, the problem was, is anytime somebody would start discussing these vulnerabilities, uh, they'd wind up getting censored. Uh, and it got to the point to where one of the forum admins actually stepped up and made a specific post and was like, look, guys, anytime somebody talks about this, we're just going to delete it. Um, that very quickly evolved into uh, rules on their website that basically said, you, you agree to be censored, or even if you don't, in order to be here, you got to click OK anyway. So this censorship really moved uh, the bulk of the people over to Hack5 forums uh, because there's not really a censorship issue there. Uh, so we began collecting vulnerability information. I spent a great deal of time researching POV's exploit and was able to ultimately figure out exactly what it was. Uh, so on July 4th of this year, I disclosed his vulnerability fully documented uh, with, with the source code to make it work. Uh, he actually came out of hiding and on one of the original posts where he had shared this information, uh, piped up and, and gave me some kudos for, for the work that I had done. Uh, I called the stuff that I released red herring, uh, because he basically left a bunch of clues that were partially right, would get you headed in the right direction, but unless you engaged your brain, you'd be basically off in a dead end. Uh, one of the things he said was that DJI products had a uh, directory traversal issue uh, in their FTP. And what it actually turned out was it was a BusyBox issue, not a not an FTP server issue. Um, and BusyBox tar uh, had an unpatched uh, dot dot slash issue that would allow you to overwrite files anywhere on the file system. So uh, after I disclosed that information, we wound up setting up a Slack group. And we've basically, at this point, got a decentralized, semi-anonymous virtual community. Um, anonymity is, is not necessary. Uh, if, if you want to be anonymous, we're completely fine with that. Uh, but basically, we've got people all over the world that are participating in this, this jailbreak of, of DJI products at this point. And just like any other community that's, that's of, of this stature, we're, we're basically everywhere and nowhere. Um, it, it's a template that's been used over and over at this point. So a lot of the folks in the group uh, shared some central concerns together, uh, and we were worried about DJI products leaking data out to the internet. And a lot of the sensitivity kind of started, uh, there was a DJI employee who made a public statement about uh, how the Chinese government could request video and audio off of the drones uh, for whatever purposes they wanted. And that kind of started a media uh, firestorm. Uh, a lot of outlets reported on that. Um, it was ultimately determined that it was a junior staffer and he misspoke, uh, so that wasn't actually the case. Uh, it turned out that the concerns that, that resulted from that were actually partially justified, um, but it wasn't exactly the way we thought. Uh, the way it was implied was that if you flew a DJI drone, basically your video got piped straight to China, and that really wasn't the case at all. What we wound up finding was that there was... Uh, some hot patching mechanisms in, in the application uh, that could basically download any functional code that they wanted, 
patch it into the application and then change its functionality. So because of that, uh, it really kind of justified that there might be some sketchy things going on in, in the application. Uh, DJI piped up and said a lot of this stuff is, is likely data analytics. They use it for collecting information uh, to basically help make sure that your product runs better. So in looking into this a little bit, we ran across a gentleman named Spy Lou. And Spy Lou happened to commit to GitHub to a hot patching open source project. Uh, and what he did was he added uh, some GPS functionality uh, to basically allow this hot patching system access to the GPS coordinates of the DJI Go app. Um, we don't ultimately know what he was doing with that or why that was added. Uh, some people think it was to help push out settings for no-fly zones uh, and, and regional settings for your drone. Uh, but at the end of the day, it really, finding that hot patching mechanism is something that could enable the data leakage concerns that people had before. So again, DJI has stated that they officially collect data to fix bugs, be more responsive in their customer service, and provide a seamless user experience for you. Um, at the end of the day, though, they actually wound up ripping a bunch of code out that they couldn't account for. Uh, they claimed that there were some third-party libraries that were in their application that actually were sending data to places that they had not authorized. Um, additionally, they went ahead and removed uh, the hot patching functionality that was built into the application. So pretty much in lockstep with this research that we were doing, a lot of rumors started popping up in the community. Uh, folks were asking, have you heard uh, DJI is going to get banned from the country? Uh, there's a group called SUAS News that publishes a lot of uh, relevant information in the drone scene. And they put out a piece uh, basically about this specific topic. And they caught a lot of flack from the community for it because it was something that wasn't verified at that point. Um, shortly after, however, there was a for, for official use only memorandum that came out from the Army that basically did exactly that and said, said that the Army, that Smirnoff wife is awful, <laughs> said that the... Uh, Whatever it is, it's awful. Uh, so they, they basically said that, uh, you know, they, they were going to ban drones from their facilities because of increasing security awareness. Uh, so at, at this point, uh, one of the people in our group spearheaded uh, a campaign to basically begin modifying the DJI app and help quell some of these concerns that people had. So there were a number of patches that put out to change the functionality, uh, prevent it from talking back to DJI, stop it from talking to Google, um, just a number of things to basically make this thing go offline. In the process, DJI wound up basically creating some countermeasures. They didn't like the fact that we were modifying their application. So they started adding uh, string obfuscation uh, to their binaries, and they actually left us a little message in there, and they said, hey, if you crack it, we're going to reinforce it. Um, there was the, the translation didn't come over quite properly. The original translation, we thought they were taunting us a little bit. It's still unclear, uh, but the best we came up with is, you know, this don't hurt anyone or each other phrase out of that. So uh, at, at this point, even though DJI began trying to, to kick out the countermeasures, the folks in our scene uh, began really kicking into full gear to make sure that this stuff was accessible to a lot of people. Uh, there was a product created called No Limit Drones, uh, and, and basically people with no technical background would have access to these, these hacks that we were pushing out, basically. So for DJI at this point, it's really uh, they're playing catch up with the rest of the community trying to stop the things that we've done. Um, one of the ways that they've responded is to come out and say that they're going to create an offline mode for their application. And to this day, it actually still isn't out. I think this was announced about a month ago. Uh, but it was kind of funny for the, the OGs in our group because we pretty much created an offline application months ago. So with regards to the hot patching stuff specifically, um, again, while we were looking for data leakage, we, we ran across this, this hot patching te technique. And this stuff could ultimately enable pretty much anything you can imagine. It, it's a way to sidestep app store policies, um, or at the very least, walk the fine line of what is acceptable versus what isn't. Um, and although we haven't really proven any malicious intent from DJI, uh, it, it's most certain that, you know, there could be a malicious developer or somebody that man in the middle is your application. There, there's a number of ways that this could be taken advantage of maliciously. So we first found uh, Tencent Tinker uh, in the Android application for DJI Go. And basically what Tinker does is takes your patch, 
merges it with the existing Android application and, and pushes it onto the phone. So the application is permanently modified from that point. Um, DJI pretty much responded immediately by removing Tinker once we pointed it out. They said it was something that they had never used. Uh, but again, it was interesting that it was there at all. We also found an analog in the iOS version, uh, which was the JS patch stuff that I mentioned, where SpyLoo was committing the uh, GPS coordinate changes to it. So this, this is a snippet from the iOS binary uh, where you can see it downloads the hot update. They had actually called it Cake for some reason. Uh, they renamed a number of the functions, and I think it was called DJI Cake Playground. Um, but, uh, yeah, basically it would download uh, this hot patch and subsequently execute it. Um, since this stuff has been removed, we have noticed that there, uh, there is still some sort of a homegrown uh, DJI patch mechanism in the application, uh, but it, at the very least, it isn't tied uh, to potentially malicious third parties. Now, FireEye uh, outlined uh, the semantics of, of JS patch, as I mentioned before, and there's a whole paper on why it may be a problem. Uh, so although DJI might not have maliciously put this in, uh, there's still some potential that somebody could maliciously abuse the functionality. Now. Uh, on the iOS side of the house, I wanted to point out that Lookout Security uh, suggested that I should look for JS Patch. Uh, it was something that they were familiar with. I was pretty well working exclusively on the Android side of the house, and they said, hey, uh, this is something that we've seen on iOS. You may want to look for it. And sure enough, as soon as I looked, that's what I found. Now, uh, the, the primary concern was that the phone application itself was doing something sketchy and pushing your data back. But a lot of people were also concerned about the possibility of the drone itself also having some sort of a, a mechanism to call back home to China, as it were. And in order to figure out whether or not that was the case, we had to take the stuff apart. So we kind of moved away from uh, application side work and dug into the drone uh, itself specifically. And what we found out was that the firmware files were just tar files. So we could untar them and start taking them apart and, and looking for stuff in them. And pretty much immediately after bin walking uh, these files, we noticed that there were some GPL code that DJI was using. Uh, so for us, that was great because it gave us a reason to put some pressure on DJI to ask them for their source code. Um, and, and at the end of the day, a lot of the people on our project were very passionate about GPL, so it kind of gave us a reason to unite as well uh, and start pushing towards a common goal. Uh, a lot of folks are, are concerned about uh, these drones basically being their property. After you buy something from Best Buy, it, it, it's yours, essentially. But in, in the case of DJI Aircraft, uh, they still retain a lot of control over your property, basically. So a lot of conversations were coming up with regards to right to repair uh, and things that were uh, similar to John Deere's situation. Now, when I first started looking at this, uh, I noticed that uh, DJI's FTP server uh, had added uh, an AES encryption function. And this FTP server was based on BusyBox, uh, so that gave me a reason to literally directly ask them for their source code. Um, as we began taking apart uh, their products, uh, we wound up creating a number of tools to help us navigate through uh, modifying firmware, uh, pushing firmware to the drones without their without the DJI specific tools. And uh, this this original gangster community, uh, as I called it before, basically uh, began to form. So this is a list of some of the, the repositories that we created to help us uh, basically control our DJI aircraft. Now, as I mentioned, uh, BusyBox was kind of at the core of some of the GPL violations that we found. And uh, I followed some of the work of Andrew, Andrew Tridgel, known as Tridge. Uh, he's part of the Samba project and also known for his ArduPilot work. And he put out a paper about uh, how to handle companies that are n basically ignoring their GPL obligations. And in this, this talk, he, he mentioned specifically that you need to go through a process to uh, try to work with these people. You might possibly need to educate them about the fact that they're using GPL. They might not know that. Um, but after you go through the initial contact, if they're kind of ignoring you, 
you get to a point to where you wind up basically have, having to fight them. And that's where we wind up with DJI. Um, a number of people have asked DJI for their GPL code over the years, and they've just blatantly said no. Um, I'm lucky enough to know some people on the inside that I could ask some you know, targeted questions to and, and try to get directed to the proper place. Um, we eventually got in touch with the legal department uh, via Brendan Schulman. Uh, so lots of thanks to Brendan for that. Uh, and at the end of the day, I had to put Bruce Perrins, uh, who is the author of BusyBox, in touch with DJI's legal team to get the code that I should have had a while ago. So there, there currently is an open source page up at DJI. Uh, they have not uh, really fulfilled all of their obligations, but they have fulfilled some of their obligations. There's a lot more code that should be here and will hopefully be here uh, in the coming year. Now, this stuff directly relates to security, uh, again, because I mentioned there was an AES uh, encryption uh, routine that they added to their FTP server. And because it was GPL, I had the right to ask for that code. So I did, and I eventually got it. So what you're looking at here is the actual mechanism that, that DJI added to enable AES and BusyBox. So obviously, if I can read the source code, you know, I, I can have no problem uh, reversing it. We had already reversed it anyway. So at this point, when we obtained it, it really didn't matter. Uh, but uh, again, the main point is uh, it gets really difficult when you're incorporating your security mechanisms into GPL-based code. So throughout their time interacting with us, DJI has had repeated failures just over and over and over. Uh, we've actually got uh, persistent vulnerabilities that span their entire product line, uh, pretty much all of their firmware versions. Uh, we have a number of private exploits uh, that, that we're not really sharing with the rest of the public. There are some exploits that are not private uh, that, you know, that have been floating around for a while. Red herring was one of those exploits. Uh, but we, we've got things that have been around pretty much since June when we started this that even as DJI has patched multiple parts of their system, we still have root access via these vulnerabilities. So one of the ones that we're holding right now is called Tar and Feather. Uh, and it's actually two separate vulnerabilities. Uh, one was found by an OG named Jan, and the other one was found by me. Uh, but we are aware that it currently roots their beta software. Um, so they, they have a program that you can sign up and get early release to their product code, and um, they still haven't found this particular vulnerability for whatever reason. We also have an exploitable race condition that we use. Uh, that uh, has, has been successful in exploiting the most recent versions of the firmware. They, as I mentioned before, made an attempt at uh, doing some string obfuscation. It took the guys like 10 minutes to reverse it. Um, they, the original key they used was I love Android. So as we're looking through the, the initial modification that they made to the code, we're like, what is this I love Android? This sticks out like a sore thumb. Well, it turned out to be a key. Um, so after we showed that we could reverse it, they subsequently changed it to something a little bit more random, uh, and that is the current password for the source code now. So every version they push out, we just reverse the strings and continue our work. And it really hasn't stopped us at all. Um, there's been an integrity check that they tried to add to the system. Uh, so that if you modify anything in the forward slash system partition, uh, when you reboot, the stuff gets wiped. Again, we took about a couple hours of time uh, digging in and we found a way to get around it. They had some binaries that ran before their system check binary ran. So we just deleted their system check binary and went about our business. Um, we've also had uh, some instances where folks have done hardware-based attacks. Uh, they... In an attempt to try to obfuscate the firmware, they added a white box encryption algorithm. And one of the guys uh, took his software-defined radio and some coils of wire and uh, applied the firmware to the drone and was able to reverse the encryption key uh, using side channel attacks, basically. Uh, so again, th th these failures just keep coming. Everything they try, uh, we get around in a couple of hours. One of the most recent ones they did uh, we were abusing uh, some debugging settings in one of their development tools. Uh, so the new version that came out, they actually put in a function that says ban dev tools. And it, you look at the source code and it sticks out like a sore thumb. You go in, you edit it, and boom, you got your stuff back. So, you know, this this stuff pretty much is, is going on ad nauseum. I mean, they, they keep putting new stuff out. We keep finding bugs in it. So uh, for me, uh, this is interesting because... DJI is currently trying to help control airspace for safety reasons. And they do that through a platform called Geo. And for me, 
you really can't claim to be doing any sort of airspace authorization if your platform is hackable. If, if I can get around your mechanisms for authorization, you're, you're really not doing anything special. Um, so in my opinion, DJI basically needs to do geo right or just hang the project up. I mean, it, it, it's not doing anybody any good. Um, so if, if you look back 10 years or so, uh, we had a concept called AAA, you know, associated with Cisco gear, authentication, authorization, and accounting. Um, that's basically what DJI is trying to do. They're really only doing one of them, maybe two if they're lucky. Um, and, and basically their, their server side, uh, authorization is a crapshoot. I mean, you can basically get around it at any point in time you want. So this was the old Cisco AAA logo or uh, workflow chart, rather, and I took and just slapped DJI information over top of it. So in the bottom, where you've got the DJI jailbreakers presented, that was where the normal failure condition would occur in, in the AAA mechanism, and, and you would not be permitted access to the system. Well, with the way DJI is doing things now, you can work through their flow chart, and you know you can get some legit, legit, legitimate authorizations, um, but we're able to also control those failure conditions. So where DJI would normally fail you from being authorized, we're able to actually allow you to go ahead and get on in. So what's next? Um, we, we pretty much beat their platform up pretty bad. Um, they're, they're still trying to play catch up. Uh, I, I don't really know where to head for them. I mean, they, they could try to incentivize us. Um, hopefully their security winds up getting a little bit better in the process of interacting with us. But I think what's going to happen is, is the folks in my group are going to get bored. We're going to probably pick some new vendors. Uh, we know, for example, that eHang as a company is a GPL violator. We had asked them for their source code and they came back and said, yeah, we don't give source code to our customers. Like, well, we're going to teach you the same lesson that we taught DJI. Um, I also have some, some folks in the group that, uh, are interested in Segway. Um, Segway actually geofences uh, their, their product where it won't run in certain areas. So that, that right away is an attractive thing to try to bypass. Um, but ultimately, I think there's going to be some folks that, that stick around. We're going to probably try to build a fort inside of our DJI gear so that they won't ever be able to get back into it. Um, root kits are probably on the horizon, quite honestly. Um, I, I think we're just going to keep playing cat and mouse, some of us. Um, DJI is, again, constantly trying to catch what we've done, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Um, at the end of the day, though, I don't really control the beast of this group that I created. Uh, these guys all have their own motives and, you know, their own desires, and they're going to kind of do what they want. Now, uh, again, to that point about incentivizing, uh, DJI has tried to incentivize us, incentivize us, and they've done that through a bug bounty program. Uh, from a quick reality check standpoint, bug bounty programs are hard. Uh, DJI has claimed that they will pay, uh, I think up to $30,000 for a vulnerability. Um, and if you look at historic payouts from other companies, um, I mean, that's, that's pretty well expected. Uh, I don't know that they'll actually ever pay out $30,000 worth of, uh, bug, but it may happen. Uh, you know, so if you look at Apple, uh, they obviously have a lot of money and they are struggling with their, uh, incentivization for hackers as well. So this, this is something that DJI is going to have a problem with. Uh, they're going to ultimately have to do it properly. Now, the guys in my group kind of don't care about this bug bounty program. Uh, we really wanted to encourage some of the new people in the scene to kind of come up and maybe present their work and, and help DJI out. Uh, academia, junior level researchers, folks like that, uh, they, they eat those bug bounties up. So, but a lot of the OGs in the group actually have conflicts of interest. Some of us work for counter drone companies. Some of us work for regular drone companies. Um, and there's just really no desire to, uh, take DJI's money basically. Um, and honestly, for me working for a counter drone company, it's, it's honestly in my best interest if DJI's products are not secure. Um, I, I honestly want them to have more bugs so that we can continue to exploit them for mitigations. Um, but really, uh, we wanted to facilitate a good gesture by DJI uh, t to our community. So we suggested that they do this. And, you know, I, I think it is a good thing that they did come out and put this program out. Uh, 
there's there's a lot of bricked hardware that we went through to get to where we're at now. So some of the guys welcomed it as a way to maybe get a couple bucks back for some things that we burn up, basically. But really, DJI is never going to match my paycheck. They're certainly not going to match my consulting rate. And, and the same holds true for a lot of the people in my group. Um, <laughs> we just do this stuff for the laughs, quite honestly. Um, and uh, I don't know if you guys know who this Latarian kid is, but uh, he's, he, uh, he stole his grandma's car. And uh, wound up on the news, and his quote is, "Yeah, I'll just let him." You could perhaps kill somebody. Yes, but I wanted to do hood rat stuff with my friends. So that's kind of where we're at, man. We we just want to do hood rat stuff with our friends. I don't really care about your money. So now, in practice, uh, the the project has been interesting. It's it's definitely changed the tone of how DJI has spoken to the folks in the OG group. Uh, there's a little bit of respect that's been formed because of their willingness to kind of interact with us. But everybody's really gun shy on, on our end. Um, we, we've, we've seen this stuff. Everybody in this room is familiar with, you know, vulnerability markets and stuff like that. And th this stuff is old hat to us. Uh, there was a paper that came out 10 years ago, the legit vulnerability market, uh, by Charlie Miller. And he discussed a lot of the semantics that DJI is currently going through and will ultimately go through here in the near future. Um, but it, it, it's funny because, uh, DJI's PR announced this program, but they have no formal web page for it. So there's no rules. Uh, there's no terms. Uh, if you look at Uber, they've got a treasure map that you can go to so you know exactly what servers you can hit and what these servers do. Uh, DJI said in their bug bounty PR announcement that we'll give you money for bugs that, you know, may impact our servers. Well, when I asked about that, they're like, yeah, don't, don't touch our servers. That's illegal. It's like, well, you guys might want to clarify the wording in your bug bounty program because you basically implied that they're on target. Um, so uh, right now there's, this is a lot of PR. Um, it, it's kind of back alley. It's not really a very well-defined program. Uh, a lot of people have suggested that uh, DJI should probably interact with Bug Crowd or a reputable company to, to try to figure out how to do this properly. But again, at this point, uh, we are completely unaware of anybody that's been paid out for a DJI bug bounty. And actually, as of yesterday, one of the OGs got really frustrated because DJI came back and said, uh, what you found wasn't really a bug. We have a way of mitigating this, you know, somewhere else. So we treat this as a known issue. Um, so after stringing this guy on for two to three weeks and implying that they were going to hook him up with some bug bounty, they turned around and said, Oh, we actually knew about that. So again, this really highlights the need for them to, to possibly reach out to somebody like bug crowd and, and do a little better job. But again, going back to, uh, that paper that Charlie Miller put out, um, th this stuff has been seen before. We all know that researchers selling vulnerabilities is an extremely risky thing for a researcher to do. Um, and that has not changed with DJI's bug bounty. Likewise, the amount of money that you can get with this stuff, those numbers really haven't changed that much over the years. Unless you're selling something really spectacular, you know, this is pretty much the range of money that you're going to get. So, uh, going back to the, the frustrated individual, uh, yesterday, he pretty much came out and flat out said, you know, this bug bounty is useless and is a complete waste of time. I really don't think DJI wants the hackers to feel that way. That, that's probably the complete opposite of how they want us to feel right now. So again, um, I'm kind of like a broken record at this point. Uh, bug crowd has reached out to help DJI. I highly suggest they take them up on that offer. Um, but at this point, some of the guys are saying things like, I'm just going to continue to keep things to myself and keep them in a small circle. So ultimately what DJI is doing now is, is driving these bugs underground. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, uh, this is a waiting game. They may do it right. They may not. Um, we'll just have to figure out and see. Now, one thing people ask me about a lot, um, or moral scruples in, in my line of work. And I'm going to touch on a couple of areas because I, I, I get beat up on a, a couple specific topics. Um, the first one is, is with regard to the fact that I operate or, or help design a counter UAS platform. Uh, I have a lot of FPV pilots that think I'm the enemy for some reason. And realistically, in my mind, unless you're representing a threat, 
we probably don't care about you. Um, so th there's a lot of unfounded fear in my mind from the FPV community uh, with regards to what counter UAS platforms are for. Now, the flip side of that is uh, as a drone user, you might be subject to bad code. And when bad code occurs with a flying lawnmower, uh, what ultimately happens is, you know, people can get hurt or, oh, Hi. Jesus, dude. Let's do it, man. Choice. Not with this one, man. Okay, the But this one's awful. a little cool. That's, that's good. Maybe we can warm it up, but. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Don't try to get me crunk in here. <laughs> so while I'm drinking this, you can watch this cat here. He, uh, He's he's talking about you know flying his his drone. He's like, oh Jesus, what's going on? Next thing you know, it locks up and starts flying off into the heavens. So I'll I'll chug race, on this while race I the video. <laughs> race the video. What do I got here? I think I got time. Oh, seven minutes? I can do that. So right now his his stuff is accelerating and he is not controlling it and it's 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 ascending up. Is that a spark by chance? Mm mm. <laughs> Stop bringing me these for Christ's sake. Ah. So, anyways, so this cat's heading up into the heavens at this point. I'm just going to go ahead and jump into the video a little bit so you can catch some of the clouds. So yeah, this, this, this cat rolls up. I mean, he's well up into airplane space at this point. You can actually Google the different layers of clouds and you can see him go through three different layers of clouds. Uh, oh yeah, way over 400 feet. So if you use Google Earth, you can actually get a little bit of perspective of how high it is. Um, so the fun part of this is this guy actually gets his back. Um, it tumbles for like three minutes, I think. So where I was heading with this though is that, uh, oh, no. as, as a pilot, no, no. So as a pilot, you might ultimately lose control of your gear. And in that situation, a counter UAS platform may actually help prevent your gear from doing something bad. So yeah, this, this guy luckily found this drone. It's funny. You can hear me in the back. Like, Holy crap. I found the GoPro. So. So main point being, uh, although you may be an awesome FPV pilot and you feel that counter drone platforms are only there to, you know, mess with you, realistically, you might have an incident where a counter UAS platform could prevent something nasty from happening. So the flip side of that is, again, uh, I, I'm a pilot. I believe in my right to fly. Uh, and I, I've had some interesting thoughts around uh, different protests where drones have been used to, to cover the area. Uh, the DAPL uh, stuff, you know, not even getting into the poli pol not even getting into the political aspects of it. Obviously, people were were using drones there to cover what was going on. I don't have a problem with that. What I do have a problem with is when you're flying a drone and there are police helicopters or other responders in the area. Um, your right to film and, and document a protest, uh, th there's a fine line there when you're talking about somebody in a helicopter that you could potentially hit and, and cause to go down. So this is actually a clip that I took uh, when I was watching uh, the, the DAPL protest live. And this guy's literally like, hey, we see this helicopter over there, but we're trying to stay away from him. And that that's just not cool. So uh, one of those guys actually uh, was charged with stalking uh, for, for that DAPL footage that he had taken. He was, you know, buzzing all the police departments that were in the area and stuff like that. So again, it's, it, it's an interesting thought when you compare your right to photography versus, you know, when you start stepping on toes. So another incident, uh, Charlottesville, uh, there was a total idiot, uh, that was literally trying to get this DJI aircraft off the ground. You can hear the helicopter behind him. I mean, it's really close. And he's like, I don't know why this thing's not taking off. I hear there's stuff in a helicopter that can jam your signal. And it's like, even if there is idiot, like, why are you trying to take off? So, uh, in a situation like that, uh, where, where you have an emergency and there are, you know, first responders in the air and stuff like that, 
I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with a counter drone platform being deployed to prevent stuff like that. Um, it, you know, was not necessarily related, but a helicopter did go down that day and somebody did die. So, um, you know, it's not something that you would want to unintentionally cause. Now, the flip side of this is, uh, I don't know if you guys paid attention, but everybody's seen this video a hundred times. This video was taken from a DJI drone. So again, that drone should not have been in the air. If you go back to the video before, this is minutes before that happened. There was a helicopter in the air. This drone should not have been up. It's wonderful that they captured the incident. Shouldn't have been there to capture it in the first place. Uh, I did hear that there was uh, some RF jammers deployed in Char Charlottesville, um, just through the, through the rumor mill, uh, and that was in conjunction with this guy saying, "Hey, I can't get off the ground. You know what's going on?" So I had looked around, and other people were saying the same thing. So there were there were rumors that there was some platform deployed to help prevent people uh, from flying drones there. Now on the jailbroken and unlocked drone side of the house. Uh, I've been told basically that I'm an enabler for people that are malicious. And I get it. Uh, I, I humbly disagree to a certain extent. Uh, one thing that I've been asked is, you know, is, is ISIS using Copter Safe? Uh, Copter Safe was a tool to unlock your DJI drone, uh, to be able to fly in no fly zones and stuff like that. Um, some of the Copter Safe information seems as if it might have been, uh, basically scrounged up from our group. Uh, so, uh, at the end of the day, anybody can go to Hobby King or any other uh, DIY company and put together a drone that has no restrictions on it at all. So you're talking about minor differences in skill level when you go out and buy a DJI aircraft that's ready to fly versus building your own. And when you build your own, there are no restrictions. So it's kind of a farce of a conversation for me. Uh, there was another guy out, uh, his name was Danny Gypsy, and he was uh, pushing a contest called Touch Big Bertha. And what he wanted folks to do was fly as close as they could to airplanes and take footage of it. So uh, shortly after his, his suggestion of a contest, uh, this clip happened in Israel, in Tel Aviv. And you should never be that close to an airplane. <laughs> like, that's stupid. So the fun thing about this idiot was he filmed himself before he went and filmed the airplane and put it on YouTube. Uh, so he wound up getting arrested for, for that flight in that no-fly zone. Uh, but a lot of people were saying that his drone must have been hacked. Um, and in that specific instance where he was able to fly at the airport, uh, he could have had a hacked drone. There's also a number of le legitimate ways in which he could have unlocked it as well. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, you know, we had another guy in, in uh, Arizona for some wildfires that was, that was flying and had downed some, some aircraft that were trying to, to do the, the rescue attempts there. And again, the, the same line of commentary was this must have been a hack drone. Um, so I get a lot of flack for, quote, again, being an enabler when stuff like this happens. Down. Say it again, brother? What does in regards to downing a drone? Well, like, if an aircraft's flying and it gets down, it's not in the air anymore. <laughs> so, so, in, 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 for search and rescue efforts, fire, uh, safety and stuff like that, they basically have a protocol that says if there is a drone in the air, you cannot fly. So there, it, it, it's a policy thing. Uh, and I'm also aware of, uh, you know, as far as the flip side of this, we had seen some folks in Texas that were trying to do SAR operations. And in order to get unlocked to operate in Texas, they had to ask DJI for an unlock code. And they were unable to get those unlock codes in a timely fashion. So we had people that were trying to do SAR work that were unable to get their aircraft in the air to do that work. Um, again, obviously, the argument is you can use a different aircraft. You don't have to use DJI. You can build your own. But again, there's there's uh, a fine line for me when you tell me that I'm an enabler in a malicious sense uh, for allowing people to control the parameters of their drones. Um, I don't think there should ever be a situation where there's a first responder that is unable to fly his aircraft because of a random you know, third party that's, that's preventing him from doing so. Now, on the scruples of the geo system itself, I also hear a lot that it's, it's a, 
it's an evil platform. Uh, and you know, one of the, the, the places that I can get down on that conversation is the fact that they collect a lot of information from people, uh, for the geo authorizations. They've collected passports, IDs, sign letters from airports, all kinds of stuff like that. And, uh, they've ultimately, uh, put themselves at risk as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's been a number of researchers that have pointed out SQL injections in DJI's web servers, for example, and they were not exactly the easiest to get a hold of to report those vulnerabilities. Uh, I had one and it took me about four months of working through internal contacts that I knew uh, to, to put pressure on people internally to fix the problem. Um, so this is actually a, a SQL error from the vulnerability that I had found. Uh, so it makes me a little uncomfortable to know that they collect a lot of data and they're not really the best at securing their backend servers. Uh, another thing about geo on July 4th, there was a number of people that were not able to get off the ground, uh, because the geo system seemed like it had been denied service. So when their drone went to check the geo system, it wasn't available. And as such, they couldn't fly. Um, so the geo system can be detrimental. Um, but again, at the end of the day, uh, it, it does help, uh, prevent people from, from flying maliciously, uh, around airports, um, or for example, in theater, uh, they had added no fly zones around, uh, Syria and Iraq at one point in, in Mosul. So counter UAS actually fits into this whole conversation, uh, in a really interesting way to me. Uh, the geo platform by DJI is obviously about control. Uh, the jailbreaking and the hacking that we're doing is obviously about control. Um, and ultimately, counter UAS platforms are also about control. So what we're seeing right now is, is literally asset owners, end users of drones, and, and the vendors of these drones are literally all fighting for control of the aircraft that the end user has bought. Now, when you look at uh, counter drone platforms... Uh, they kind of enable a real finite level of mitigation control. Um, they're not necessarily dependent on any one entity uh, alone. If you look at uh, DJI's Geo, for example, uh, it's entirely dependent on DJI's fly safe team. So if they don't respond to you, you're not going to get unlocked. Um, Hack drones really don't matter to, to CUAS systems necessarily, um, but they would matter to DJI's geo system. With a hack drone, they have very little uh, way to enforce their no-fly zones, for example. Uh, but a counter drone platform would still be able to interact with the drone over RF or whichever other mitigation techniques. Now, when you're talking about counter drone platforms, one thing that's really, really important is that you don't have any fratricide. Uh, and fratricide is basically where you wind up uh, friendly fire, for, for lack of a better term. Um, and when you're talking about, for example, people's cell phones and their ability to call 911 uh, or make you know critical emergency calls, for example, you don't want to take out somebody's ability to communicate with the excuse of, hey, I was trying to mitigate a drone, uh, especially if you're talking about a disaster scenario. Um, you know, people may actually legit need to call 911 and just blatantly jamming the whole spectrum to prevent drones isn't really going to help you much. So, uh, with, with a counter UAS platform, you can basically target specific drones, uh, as, as opposed to just blatant wholesale jamming. Now, with kinetic platforms, that gets a lot more difficult. Uh, you, <laughs> you wind up, uh, you know, you're, you're spraying, you're spraying lead. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's a lot more difficult to be, uh, specific which, with, with which targets that you wind up hitting. Um, now, uh, at, at one point, the Raytheon Phalanx system was used, uh, as a counter UAS, counter UAS platform. And there were some tests that were done. And basically, this really highlighted uh, what, what I'm talking about with regards to the, the ability to be specific with kinetics. Uh, there were there were two incidents that were that were jotted down uh, that you can find on Wikipedia uh, back in the late '80s. And what had happened was uh, while this phalanx system was engaging one of the drones, uh, some of the uh, debris wound up coming back and hitting the ship uh, and ultimately killing some people. Um, in another incident. Uh, 
they had multiple ships in an area and uh, the, the system engaged with the drone. Uh, the drone went down and as the drone was going down, uh, the system re-engaged with the drone and wound up peppering up the side of another ship that was in the area and again killing some people. So it was literally like a circular firing squad kind of situation. I don't know what happened to that image, but it just disappeared. There we go. Um, so uh, that's the kind of stuff that you don't really want your counter drone platform doing. Now, if you've never heard or seen anybody shoot down a drone, this this video is great. I'm, I'm going to let you guys watch this. So this is Peshmerga. And uh, they've got a fixed wing drone. And they'll, they'll light it up here in a second to where you can see it. But I want you to listen to the amount of lead that they spray in the air. Now think about this going over a, on at a sporting event or something like that, you know, like. I don't know how much they've shot at this thing at this point, but you guys get the picture. So again, you don't necessarily want to be using kinetics for your counter drone platform. Um, it just, maybe some places it'll work out, but again, you're not going to do that over a football stadium. Just not going to happen. <laughs> right. So again, at the end of the day, uh, you know, counter UAS platforms, the operator of the platform itself is, is in control as opposed to a random entity like DJI, for example. Now, uh, I think that a successful counter UAS platform should also be able to play it well with other aspects of your organization. Uh, you should be able to have uh, standards of communication that go back with your other sensors and your other products so that you can do correlation basically. Um, one way to do that is with the Android Attack Toolkit, for example. And for those of you that are not familiar with that, uh, ATAC is actually deployed uh, by a number of uh, law enforcement, uh, emergency responders, governments, uh, firefighters, and, and, and folks like that. It's a really popular platform. And what it allows you to do is, is have a, a collaborative messaging system uh, and, and push correlation events. Now, the, the Mesmer uh, counter drone platform that I work on actually happens to be an ATAC plugin uh, for that specific reason, to enable it to function within these existing environments that people have set up within ATAC. Um, now, the fun thing about CUAS is uh, the reason that I think you need to have a collaborative system is that you're not going to find a one-size-fits-all system. You'll find other uh, drone counter drone companies out there that say, "Hey, this is this is the one that you need. We will get everything." And I, I think that's kind of an obtuse statement to make. Um, and ultimately, what you wind up with are uh, rings of protection. And, and this isn't something that should be unfamiliar to you guys. But ultimately, you, what you'll wind up with are a uh, combination of both kinetic and RF based mitigations at the end of the day. And once something gets to, you know, your center ring that you've deemed as being critical, you may wind up opening up all the guns and shooting like you're the Peshmerga. Um, now, uh, again, I, I think this stuff is directly intertwined, uh, drone security and CUAS. Um, there's a lot of concepts that spill over from traditional security into uh, drone security. And for me, the, the drone jailbreak scene that I've, I've helped create uh, is basically a way of gathering intel uh, about specific drones, uh, particularly with the purpose of being able to gain mitigation information. Um, so we're, we're hacking the internals of these drones uh, with the intent of, of being able to find bits and pieces of data to, to be able to mitigate them with. Now, um, we've seen uh, use of force models uh, come into play uh, in, in drone scenarios as well. So for a counter drone platform, uh, there's a number of bits of logic that you can use for when you choose to engage uh, and how hard you choose to engage a particular uh, threat that you wind up with. And this stuff looks just like you would see in a law enforcement uh, use of force continuum or use of force triangle, for example. Uh, as uh, different levels of threat present themselves, you, you wind up with different escalations of, of response, ultimately. We've also seen uh, physical security uh, come into play with drones. Uh, we've got some guys that I mentioned, again, are doing uh, side channel attacks. 
Uh, this is, this is standard 101 stuff that we've seen, uh, in, in, in normal computer security. Uh, so this is an image of Freak Van Tienen actually, uh, extracting the white box AES key from DJI's, uh, firmware. And he did that again via physical access to the drone. Uh, so, there's also a lot of crossover with regards to risk modeling. Uh, this is a risk model that I presented uh, a couple months back. And ultimately what it is, is it's a modified version of Microsoft's Dread. And I've massaged it to specifically work for drone threats. Um, and again, this, this stuff looks just like you would see with any other, you know, threat mitigation uh, flowchart. Uh, there's, there's various risks and potential impacts and possibility. And, uh, that ultimately may decide how you respond to a particular threat. That's pretty much all I've got. Um, so at this point, I'm just going to give you guys some, uh, points of contact for me. Uh, if you want to reach out to me at department 13, this is my, uh, business card. So feel free to go ahead and reach out. The Slack OGs, the folks that are doing the bulk of the work uh, on the modding and the tweaking and whatnot of DJI drones, you can find them on the Slack channel. This is the invite here. Uh, also, the Retro ROMs website that I mentioned is kind of our front page. Uh, the original Hack 5 forum where we moved to, to get around the censorship. Um, and then also some, some RC groups threads as well. Now, uh, an another way that you can kind of reach out to me is uh, to try to troll me. And... Uh, I, I, I ran across a presentation that was, I think it was at Black Hat or DEF CON. And, uh, basically there was a company that was presenting a penetration testing, penetration testing drone. And I think ultimately that's what they were trying to sell is their penetration testing services. So in the process of doing this, uh, they decided that it was a good idea to take all of the counter drone companies that they could find and poke fun at them basically. And, and we were one of those companies. Um, and, and they said that they thought our marketing was a little bit ahead of itself. So the fun thing for me is, is this, this danger drone platform that they pushed, um, Right in the middle of the picture, number five, um, are some telemetry radios. And they just so happen to be a telemetry radio that I'm really, really familiar with. And uh, some of the folks on my team are also really familiar with. Mike here is really familiar with as well. Um, you might remember Mike and I did a talk a couple years ago in which we dropped zero day for this particular radio. So I think you would be a fool to think that in the two years that I've worked at Department 13 that we haven't. Uh, productized uh, the vulnerabilities that I dropped at the talk that I gave two years ago. So this is a picture of uh, the Mesmer platform, uh, and this is what it looks like when we see a 3DR solo. Uh, the screen is pretty much the exact same thing when we see a 3DR radio uh, for telemetry. So um, basically, if you got a danger drone, come at me, bro. <laughs> So that's all I got, folks. Uh, we will hopefully be bringing a mitigation demo uh, to a conference real soon. Uh, the plan is to uh, show a live demo against a danger drone and, and show how the Mesmer platform works. So if you guys have any questions, let's have them. Go for it, brother. So as I understand, DJI is now a billion-dollar company. Is that right? They, they, they are noted as being the number one and the largest consumer drone company. I don't know what their numbers are right now, but yeah, they're, they're pretty much the biggest one. In your opinion, why are they unsuccessful in security? Well, for, for drones, uh, it, it's not a feature that people care about. You know, they, they want to know how, how high is the quality of my video? How far can I fly the thing? Uh, mo most of the consumers, Security is not a market differentiator for, for drone companies. Um, I think that's rapidly changing, uh, but right now it's